Hello everyone. Welcome to my shop. I'm Robin. Today we're going to talk about getting rid of the weak link on your lathe, which is the compound, which isn't here. Uh, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But uh, just wanted to thank everyone, uh, all the new subscribers. Very much appreciate your, uh, your uh, signing up. Um, we're well past uh, 10,000. And as I've said before, that's not my uh, motivation, but it's very encouraging. Um, you guys leave extremely, extremely gracious uh, comments, uh, very much appreciated, um, very encouraging words. I'm glad to hear that uh, people are, are finding some useful information in what I'm, what I'm presenting. Uh, a big shout out to uh, Tom Lipton, Ops, Ox Tools. Uh, very, very much appreciate his promoting my channel on his channel. Um, he very graciously sends people my way and um, he's a good guy and if you aren't subscribed to uh, Ox Tools, um, you should be. Uh, please go visit Tom. Uh, it's hard for me to believe that anybody that watch, watches uh, any of my stuff isn't watching Tom Lipton, but um, yes, uh, please, uh, please visit Tom also and a big thank you to Tom. Um, very, very gracious. It, it's very obvious that Tom is truly interested in promoting the machining, uh, the continuation of machining education and his uh, selfless uh, acts of promoting other people. So really, really appreciate it. Um, also, uh, Stefan Gottsvitter, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing his last name properly, um, also uh, has given me a shout out on, on his channel, sent lots of uh, his subscribers my way. Very much appreciate it also. Um, a very a very good guy excellent content on his on his channel also and uh, also um, Pierre's garage um, he's uh, given a shout out to me also sent lots of his viewers my way uh, also very much appreciated and, and uh, check him out if you're not uh, not watching his videos also so um, we're going to get to it and look at uh, why replacing the compound can uh, improve the performance of your machine immensely. So what's my beef with the compound? Well the compound is the weakest link in the lathe, uh, especially on small hobby lathes uh, and lathes where the finesse in fitting the gibs and the quality of the fit of the gibs and just the design in general is uh, compromised. The T-slot even on the best of them. This T-slot is ridiculously small. Can you ever get enough force on there no matter how tight you tighten your stud for your Loris tool post that it won't spin? No. It's just a weak link. This compound is in exceptionally good condition. It's probably better than than when it left uh, the factory. Uh, ground, dovetails, scraped the matching, everything's perfect and it's still the weak link. I hardly ever, ever, ever have it on the machine. In 20 years of using this machine and doing job shop work, I've used this, I put this compound back on literally maybe four times. Uh, so, if you have a compound, one little uh, trick, and when I do put this on, I'm usually out for uh, a taper that's pretty, uh, you know, pretty good. And one of the things that can happen with a compound is when you're working with it, especially when it's not uh, all that uh, beefy, is that as you crank this, you are putting loads sideways this way, sideways that way. You're taking this in an orbit, and since it's connected to the moving part 99% of the time, you are massaging this, and you'll actually see it in your work if you're doing precision things. I have a drive bar that I've made here that basically has an ID uh, that is the same size as the inner ball here of the... Um, handle, the ball handle, and then it has matching slots, one small, one larger, that match the, match the tapered section on here, such that this forms a universal joint on this. So this, you, this can pivot without influence, and then you can crank back here, and you can get a nice smooth feed without putting any influence. This is supplying pure torque, because the re reaction forces to the torque are being taken by my hand here, there are no reaction forces here, just pure torque. So there's no lateral up and down motions, no influences there, and you can do a real nice feed by hand. Um, yes, I've seen guys put drills and all this on, but this is pretty handy. 
and also allows you to stop on you know on a dime wherever your your markings are. So if you're going to use the compound, handy piece to make. This is just a piece of phenolic tubing, a couple uh, aluminum inserts in here with a set screw. This is aluminum glued in. So just a note. So what's the main motivation for getting rid of the compound? Well, the compound um, is an additional axis that typically isn't going to have a digital readout scale on it. So its position is going to be variable and is going any time it moves at all, even if it were perfectly rigid, uh, its position changes. It, it ruins the offsets of your tools because you've only got X and Z and as soon as that dub, the cross light or compound moves, you've messed up your offsets. And you have your nifty new digital that has multiple tool offsets so you can use multiple tools. Well, that's wonderful as long as the tool post doesn't move. It has to be like a CNC machine where those tools are fixed place and you can count on them coming back to the same location. So that's the driving force behind getting rid of the compound. Besides the rigid rigidity issue, um, it's the repeatability issue of it being something where this cannot turn rigidly fixed. It's not relying just on the friction of the bolt holding it down. It's got the screws that bear on the corner and a dowel pin that keeps it from being able to move. Uh, and it has a very wide stance of, of a bearing on here such that it basically is totally immovable. You can snap things off, break things, break inserts, break drills, do whatever you're doing. Um, that thing isn't going to lose its place. Now, why would that be a big deal? Well, um, it could be a big deal if you've got, um, you know, maybe 50 some odd Allure's holders and a few up here with the CBN tools in and a couple over there on the Tormach. So that's why uh, it's important. Every one of those tools, um, the X value on them will all be saved because my... Um, Digital has 99 tool offsets in it, so I can have up to 99 different tools. So when I go and grab one of these boring bars or a turning tool or a groove tool or whatever, the X value is good from last time. Now obviously Z is going to move around as you go from part to part and all that, but those are really easy to set up. And just having one, the diameter itself, uh, be correct is a huge advantage. So that's the reason for the emphasis on the tool post staying put. And with the tool post being strewed to the axes of the machine, now all of a sudden you can do all your tool setup and things on your Lorsch block relative to knowing that it's square to the machine axes. One of the very handy things about having the tool post uh, fixed like this in a, in a digital uh, with multiple tool offsets is the number 35 Lorsch holder with the drill chuck. So this becomes my basically my tailstock. Uh, and I have exact control with my Z um, digital readout and it doesn't uh, eliminate taper shank tooling because I have a taper shank tool holder a 53 versus the 35 and this has my own um, rotary brooch in here from uh, probably 15 years ago I made it, uh, several of these sold a couple to my brother my brother and my nephew um, and uh, so when you need a taper shank uh, that is also available on here and also you have the correct offset so I punch in number 23 I know my center height is good height is good because I adjusted this and my X position is good because my, I set my offset on the um, digital using an indicator in the spindle so very very versatile parting is one of those areas where the lack of rigidity of the compound causes the most grief and you will see the most improvement if you make one of these solid tool post mounts. Uh, this is two and a half inch diameter stainless running a thousand RPM. It's a six jaw chuck that's got an extremely good grip on the part and um, it's a insert tool holder with your typical parting insert coolant on uh, two thousandths per rev feed and when this uh, actually cut starts you'll be hearing live sound. It won't be voiceover. Uh, you'll be hearing how the machine behaves and contact. Yes, those chips are dangerous. Don't get your hands in there.
Notice you're not hearing any chatter, no clatter, no nothing. No blue chip. Simple as that. It's a corner of the tool post here on the far side over there. Uh, there is a dowel pin hole that is hard drilled into the hardened uh, body here. And it also has a release a relief so that the dowel pin actually hits on two spots, a little a smaller diameter relief groove that allows the dowel pin to sit perfectly centered. These are two 3 8 24 socket head uh, set screws that bear on that. Those are what forcibly push this thing in this direction and line it up and uh, push very hard on it against the pin so that this thing is immovable. The actual center post here is not uh, keeping this thing from spinning. It's just holding it down. Uh, and this is the, my post for my indicator. Uh, so that's a very important aspect of this is that this mechanically this is held so it cannot spin whatsoever on this block. And then obviously with the four uh, M8 screws bolted in, um, it can't go. So procedure on this was put this, put this block on first and bolt it down. Then I lined this with a um, Loris uh, tool post piece, uh, tool block, that has its uh, leading edges ground flat relative to the mounting uh, dovetail part. Tram that in with the uh, ax Z axis of the lathe and adjust this thing with the two set screws until it's square. Uh, one thing that's uh, of, of great importance here is that when these two screws are torqued up uh, very hard against that pin, it actually uh, bows this this piece, believe it or not, it bows it like this so that the, the back it curves in this direction so it's got a, a hump like that. So the four pads that this sits on under the bolt heads, uh, after this was completely stressed like that, I re-scraped this so that it sat on this the uh, cross slide uninfluenced. If you don't do that, it would rack the cross slide and cause the cross slide to wear irregularly and start to get play. So very important aspect of this one, the high stresses that are on these screws, making sure this doesn't spin, uh, that the deformation that occurred in this block uh, was scraped out as far as the mounting surface. Uh, so everything's happy. Here's what I was talking about on the bottom of the Alurus holder, where this is a 3 8 diameter hole that is hard drilled uh, and milled whatever into the base. This is fairly hard. And then this is a quarter inch end mill where it relieves and these two lines here roughly hit the dowel pin at about 45 degrees. And what that does is ensure that regardless of if the pin's a little undersized or whatever there's no lateral play because when this gets pushed in this direction the, the by the two set screws on the back it forms a v-block effect that makes sure this thing is totally immovable in that corner. This is the block that replaces the compound. It's a piece of cast iron uh, designed. Notice that none of these surfaces are horizontal here other than this top one. But anything around the, con the, uh, the tool holder sit on is angled such that stuff will fall and run off. And we have four big M8 uh, mounting studs that go in here to mount it to the um, cross slide. And yes, I drilled and tapped holes into the cross slide for those. Uh, but we want a good substantial mount on that. Here you can see the other side, same thing, there's our fourth hole uh, that bolts it down. And same thing here, we've got the angled surfaces to clear so that the uh, things don't pile up here, chips don't pile up on that. So here's what the bottom of that looks like. This is actually milled right into the bottom of the block, the actual ring that seats in the standard parting compound uh, style of, of pivot here. Uh, clearance for the key that's in the standard Harding mount, the woodruff key that goes into the compound. Um, and this is just clearance. Uh, but because we're gripping down here on this lower surface, these are actually raised feet and they're part of what had to get scraped when we sat here. So this screw, in order to not cause any issues from where we designed this, had to go down in the gully here this one's out here on the outer corner, um, but the, this is the areas that got hand scraped after it was racked to uh, make sure we weren't distorting the compound. 
So when I put this back on, I just use the play and these bolt holes to re-indicate it in. I don't have to mess with the set screws or the amount of distortion that's in the block. It's LPS3 that I put on there. Uh, really good long-term uh, long uh, lubrication for something like this. Got my block lined up. Drop this back on. These holders have the faces have been ground true to this. So when I indicate, I'm getting a good indication of the alignment of the, the tool post. Now I'll traverse the, uh, the carriage and just tap the whole entire block in until that reads. zero for full travel here. So as I indicate this in, this ensures that the uh, we get a repeatable alignment of the tool post when we put this on, um, which is important for uh, when we put it back and forth from putting the compound on if we need it and, and re re returning this. Also ensures that the drill chuck that I showed and the Morse taper socket that I showed actually are true to the machine axis as far as parallelism to the uh, Z, Z travel, which is very important. Also, the four M8 bolts that, that I'm tightening here in the base and the very wide stance of those ensures that this thing is basically immovable, which is very important. I hope you found something uh, interesting or informative in this. Uh, if you did, please subscribe, tell your friends, share, and uh, sorry about the glare here. It's a problem I uh, haven't found a fix for yet. So um, I'll be back with some more.